Hey guys, it's Bella and this is our seventh Gutis um, Gothic lesson, exciting fun stuff. And our little historical tidbit for today is Gothic food and like cuisine, quote unquote, in Ostrogothic or just like and Visigothic countries. So um, the short of it is that the food which the Ostrogoths and Visigoths ate probably didn't wasn't very different to that of the romance people or of the roman people which they coexisted with so it's quite difficult for us to identify significant differences in the archaeological record um some of the things we could maybe look at are um nitrogen ratios in their bones to see whether they were eating more or less meat or seafood um but because they're going to be eating mostly sort of regional foods it can be quite hard to see if maybe they're like doing them in different ways cooking them in different ways um you might have specific archives of pottery finds um, in Italian context which could give you some clues but you know we, it's very hard to tell from the archaeology but fortunately we have some I, um, some little hints surviving in the third century common era writings of the Roman Celio Apicius uh, the recipes in Antimus's De Observazione Ciborum and although it was addressed to a Frankish king, it could reflect some general culinary trends among the sort of early Germanic peoples. So as a sort of way of getting ourselves into the material culture, like one of the ways I said that we might look at, figure out from the archeological record how they cooked is to look at the sort of material culture they used, right? And this is one of my favorite items in the British Museum because I just love the sort of everyday nature of it. It's literally a, um, a cooking pan and it has inscriptions on the rim around the outside here and in the center and frankly it's kind of weird so on the rim it actually has a quote from um the book of revelations um a lion of the tribe of judah's root conquers david hallelujah so richard leo de was judah and this david hallelujah and then in the on the interior we have this inscription um in nomine domini, Deo cici maneficium admirare, which, if we read it literally for what it is on there, it says, in the name of the Lord, um, admire the work, the handiwork of Deo Cicius. Um Now, there's a few really weird things. First of all, this name, uh, Deo Cicius, is not, I mean, I, I've not seen it anywhere else. I tried to do a corpus search. I couldn't find it. Um, it doesn't seem to be a common Greek or Roman name. Um, what it does, what it does, um, seem like, maybe it's a, um, maybe it's a gothic name and the D is sort of their spelling of a thorn, who knows, it's hard to say. Um, we can also see in the word manificium, the, um, because the M isn't actually written, it's just, um, it's been abbreviated, we can see the sort of vulgar Latin pronunciation of Latin that the, the Visigoths had, um, but more interestingly, this word, Maneficium is extremely rare. Like it would literally be sort of from the words mane meaning hands and ficium meaning craft or something that's been made. Um, but it's really, really rare. What isn't rare is a similar word called maleficium, which you, as you can hear sounds very, very similar, which means witchcraft. And because I's and E's often get confused, I'm wondering myself if Deo uh, Chicos is actually meant to be Deo Chicos. Um, meaning sort of blind to god so maybe this is a reference to some kind of like pagan gothic sorcerer left over in the visigothic kingdom who's known for making these like magical uh cooking implements who is sort of blind to the christian god um and and, and instead of maleficium we're actually meant to be admiring his maleficium his, his witchcraft his sorcery um you know it's a bit of a flimsy interpretation but that this isn't an academic journal so i get to have a bit of fun with it but yeah, that's um one of my favorite uh, little things in the British Museum, really fun. If any of you are ever there at some point, you should have a look, it's um, ne next to the Sutton Hoo exhibit. So, Anthemus's letter on the observation of food. So, Anthemus was a Byzantine physician, so an Eastern Roman physician who served both King Theodoric of the Franks and King Theodoric of um, the Great of the Ostrogoths, and he wrote a letter to the former Theodoric containing uh, dietetic advice with certain revelations about Frankish habits, and one of these is that they liked to eat raw bacon, apparently, which um, Anthemus did not think was very good for your health, for probably quite reasonable reasons. <laughs> and 
among this like diet advice, he has several shorter recipes, which they're probably of Byzantine or Roman origin, but they were therefore probably eaten at the Frankish and Ostrogothic courts also because it's the, the sort of king's doctor who's advising them to eat this. And this little section here is very, of the letter is very interesting because it basically says, you know, we who have, who have various foods and various delights and various drinks, we have to be careful to control ourselves so that we don't, from, so that from the abundance we don't get fat. And if we look at this mosaic of King Theodoric, yeah, he kind of looks a bit tubby, especially when compared to um, Justinian, whose mosaic takes his place later on. So um, later on in this same, in this same letter, we have a fascinating um, recipe for piglet cooked in oxymel, which is a sort of a sauce. And um, here it is in Latin. And I'm going to pause on this bit because here is an English translation because if it's really simple. And if you guys want to um, cook it yourselves at home, you can pause the video here and you can write down the recipe and you can make it yourself. Um, it's so easy, like the pork, you, know, you just have the meat and you have it in a thing, in a, in a dish, and the sauce is just made out of two parts honey and one part vinegar. And I like to put some salt in there for the taste. And it's really great. And I actually made it this morning for my, um, for my lunch. And this is how it came out. Um, I actually used chopped sausages for the suckling piglet because the point of using suckling piglet is that it has a lot of um, fat in it and sausages are quite good for that. And obviously it's going to be pork. So there you go. Um, that's what it looks like. Very tasty. It's, it's basically like sweet and sour sauce. Um, fantastic. Highly recommend. Um, he talks here in the letter about what kind of bread um, the king should eat. So he says, um, Panem nitidum bene fermentatum non asimum, sed bene coctum commendendum. So um, he says, white and not, and, and well fermented and not unleavened bread, but well cooked bread is to be eaten. So this gives us a sort of indication of the kinds of breads which are considered, um, which are considered suitable for people to eat. And we can see in frescoes from, oh, these are frescoes from Pompeii, so Roman art, but they're showing various kinds of bread, uh, panis quadratus, as we can see here. Um, these are like still life photos. And we can see in these sixth century mosaics from the church of San Vital in Ravenna, um, which show saints, martyrs eating similarly shaped bread, that this kind of bread was probably current in Ostrogothic Italy. Um, is somebody trying to talk or? Okay. Um, so this moves us on to um, Apicius's De Re Coquinare, or On the Culinary Art. So Apicius's treatise contains hundreds of very luxurious food recipes for wealthy Romans, which incorporate all sorts of exotic spices and this is a picture from a very well done manuscript of Epictetus that you can access online. Vatican City Biblioteca Apostolicana, Vatican Urbanas Latinos, uh, I don't know how to say that in Latin, and then Folio <laughs> Um Which brings us on to uh, the Apicia Escherta Venerarium Vira Nostris, um, which is in BNF MS Latin 103, sorry, 1000, no, 10,318, goodness. Uh, between photos 196 and 2003. This manuscript contains excerpts from Apicius's book made by a senator called Venedarius, which Joseph Wieling, the scholar Joseph Wieling in 1920, identified as a Gothic name, Venetaharius. So this, plus the linguistic evidence of the text, might date these excerpts to the 6th century rather than to the 7th or the 8th century that the script of the manuscript imply. And so what this could be is it could be a sort of oral culinary tradition based originally on Apicius, but which has been altered over the centuries to fit Gothic sensibilities and availabilities. So here is the um, start of the page itself. And this part of the uh, manuscript contains um, sections which um, have been added by, um, which have been added 
seemingly wholesale by Vinodarius himself. These don't occur in the originals. And I see somebody talking about making um, the recipe and salt. And yes, exotic spices, just spices from various parts of the empire, Egypt, Syria, etc. Um, the spices in Vinitharius's sort of excerpts are actually much more, they're much tamer, they're more regional, um, they have a smaller list, and actually here we can see a sort of concern with the matter of exotic spices. Um, this red at the top here says, a brief list of the pigments or spices that should be in the home so that nothing is lacking of the condiments. Now granted, um, Apicius has a similar um, list at the start of his, but his list is much longer of the foods that people need to have. It takes up much more. Um, and this list seems to be a new one added by Vinidarius, perhaps to reflect the concerns of Ostrogothic cooks. And what's really interesting here is this word that I've underlined, adenna, um, which I've tried really hard to search in corpuses of, of Latin and Greek. Um, it doesn't seem to be a word. Um, so it might be a Gothic cologne word, an unattested Gothic word, for a um for a kind of spice that they used all the time in their kitchens we we can't fully know um there's a lot to say also about the the language that's used here it sort of gives you an insight into how the latin of ostrogothic italy sounded and if you want to hear more about that i recommend you go to my um video on my channel and doing a deep dive on the ostrogothic cookbook which brings us to the question of what exactly does Winita Haris tell us about food in the Ostrogothic kingdom. So I think that the excerpts from Apicius paint the picture of a sort of first generation goth who's been appointed to the Senate and he's writing down some of Apicius' recipes, perhaps from an oral tradition, in order to emulate them in his own life. And he's including some of his own recipes along the way. Vinitharis' list of essential spices is original, and it speaks to a declining availability of the spices which Apicius once used, um, and fitting within a sort of single quatrain of eight folios. The excerpts are actually quite well suited for distribution and copying, so this is the kind of length of text that oftentimes would circulate in medieval times as like a pamphlet, so it could have been that this was intended for a more general distribution than the one manuscript that we have here. Um, and Yes, Pale, so, so the, um, the, what is it, the, the two Ds in the word Adena could well be, um, thorns, because that's quite common. Um, sometimes in sources, um, thorns get rewritten as Ts, um, so yeah, Ts or Ds are your options. It's possible that there was a H as well beforehand that's been dropped. It's also possible that the E was originally, obviously, in, like, the Gothic language written as AI. Um, it's sort of hard to say, um... It's a real mystery, that word. I don't know. I no idea what it is. Um, wait, has somebody identified? Yeah, thorns. There we go. Yeah. So, yeah. And one thing that we can really identify from Vinita Haris' experts is, sorry, excerpts is the Goths' apparent love of this food called Amolu. And um, so whereas many other medieval sources and food describe bread as the staple which is paired with all other dishes, in Vinitharius' excerpts, most dishes are to be served mixed with amalum, which is a stipulation that we don't get in Apicius at all. Apicius, I don't think, mentions amalum. So this could represent a specifically Ostrogothic culinary tradition, although amalum is also mentioned by Cato the Elder in his treatise De Agricultura, but aside from Cato the Elder, the word is actually quite rare in the Latin corpus. So what it could be is that the Goths sort of arrived in Italy, saw that the lo some of the local people were making amalu, and they sort of quite liked it, and so they made it the staple for all of their foods. A bit like how in many cultures of the world today, um, you sort of have rice and curry and rice with, paired with various dishes. For the Goths, it seems like um, amalum was their staple food like rice. Um, and here is a, a recipe on the screen for how you make amalum from K to the Elder. <sighs> if I'm being honest, I'm not fully sure how it is. I believe that there's a reenactment society that has attempted to recreate it. Um, based on this description, I would sort of say that it's like, almost like uncooked dough, I think? Because it's, you know, it's wheat. Um, it's like wheat that's been really softened and so it all mixes together. It's it's a bit confusing, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm sure there are ways that you could um, 
that you could make it at home. By the way, guys, th this whole video will be on YouTube, so you don't need to, if you miss a screenshot, or I can just give you the slides, you can sort of get it in your own time. Um, this brings us all the way to, uh, goodness, to uh, Porcello Um which is my favorite. It is one, it's very unique in that it has specific uh, instructions for quantities. So we ha we see here um, liquamen hemina, so a half pint of liquamen, ole, full pint, aqua hemina, so a half pint of water. So we have specific quantities, which is quite rare in medieval recipes. They very rarely write down how much of each ingredient you're meant to use. But because this uh, recipe gives us um, so many specific instructions we can create it quite easily and also it happens to be that the um ingredients are quite easy to get in your day-to-day -day lives and um it's more interestingly it seems not to be it's not in uh Apicius's original at all so either this is it was originally in Apicius and hasn't survived in the other copies which is possible but a bit unlikely or what we have here is we have an inserted gothic recipe maybe it's a mixture of sort of gothic and roman cooking that's been mixed in with all the roman recipes um, and vinitharius is claiming that it comes from apicius so here is um the pickled pork recipe if you guys want to take a screenshot um you will adorn finely chopped pork and put it in a sauce thus composed you will add to a pestle 50 grains of pepper, as much honey as suits, three dried onions, a bit of green or dried coriander, half a pint of liquamen, and for liquamen I recommend you use um, sort of um, East Asian fish sauce, fermented fish sauce, you can get it in most supermarkets, um, a half pint of oil and a half pint of water. You will temper them together in a casserole and you put the pork in that. And when it will have started to boil, you stir it often until it becomes thick. And if it becomes sort of it makes less liquid so if it gets too thick then you add more water and so you cook it thoroughly and and when it's done you serve the pork and this is what happened when I did in fact serve the pork so and I can tell you from experience it's like really nice um I'm trying to think of it, it's gonna sound like a weird way of saying it but the best way to describe it actually is like um it tastes like a hot dog with um with sort of cheese, onions, uh, and mustard, but no ketchup. That's like the best way to describe it. No, it is not vegan, obviously, because it's pork and because the Ostrogoths did not care about animal rights. Um, but you could, I'm sure you can substitute, um, you can substitute, um, pork for like corn or whatever you want. Um, and I'm sure, and what's the word? I mean, it would taste a bit different, but not too different. And I mean, the fish sauce, you know, if you think fish, if you can't fish in your veganism, then I guess that's a problem as well. Um, I don't actually know if you can't use fish sauce, what you would substitute for it. Um, I'll have a think about it. Um, it's quite, it's quite a unique kind of product, liquid. But anyway, that's what it looks like. So, you know, this is, aside, yeah, I mean, this might have been a kind of thing that got served in Ostrogothic kitchens. Who knows? Um, and a last point I want us to think about is this quote from the Gothic Bible. Um, Eat Jesus quath, worki thans mans anakumpian. Um, make that man sort of lie down to recline. And this word is borrowed from the Latin recumbere, and it's a verb that's used to describe people sort of reclining at feasts, like we see these people doing in this mosaic depicting a Roman feast. And this sort of suggests that the Goths, at least at the time of Wilfulness conversion, were sort of adopting some sort of Roman uh, culinary practices. So the evidence for them borrowing culinary practices dates much earlier than uh, the Exodus of Apicius that we have. It seems to be from the very beginnings of their Christianization. And, and so they use some of the same vocabulary for it. They might have started to have feasts where they reclined here, just as... Um, the Romans did. Now it's an interesting question of how, when reclining, um, they would perform at the lyre, because Isidore of Seville says that the lyre would be played at feasts like this and it would be passed around, but it's possible that each of these sort of um, attendees would stand up when their time came and they had to perform a song at the lyre. Um, and you can also have a look here at the kinds of 
of foods that would be eaten and the ways that they might be served at the time. So um, very interesting stuff. And it's just a sort of way to get us to think about the ways in which that like Gothic and Roman culinary traditions would combine in the Ostrogothic and Visigothic kingdoms. So that having been done, 